There's a new version of Vim, Vim 9.0 dropped, and it brings some interesting new features, primarily a brand new scripting language for configuration and getting your editor the way that you like it. But this is pretty weird, actually. It's a whole new scripting language. It's not something off the shelf like Lua, which is the best, or like a Python or some kind of JavaScript thing even. It's a completely new programming language that then gets embedded into Vim 9 going forward. I and many people in the community are a little concerned about this. Anytime a new technology comes up, especially programming languages, there's always concerns of bugs and little features not being there. I mean, just look at JavaScript, for example. In its early days, it went through years and years of having tons of bugs, a bad garbage collector, and just not really great usability features embedded in it. Thankfully though, we have NeoVim, which has become the more popular variant of core Vim, and it uses Lua for its configurations. Mm, Lua, it's so good. Okay, well, what is Lua? It's an extremely lightweight, small programming language that you can embed into existing systems, like a game engine or a web server or a text editor like NeoVim. Since Lua is a very well-established technology already, you could just Google for all the things. It's already there out in the wild. Whereas a new technology like this new Vim script there's a big brain gap online for things that you would commonly need to search for. So in this video, I want to give a brief overview of how you can configure NeoVim with only Lua. And this is what I do in my day to day. I don't use any Vim script inside of my NeoVim configurations. And I hope that this video is a good kind of launching off point for somebody who maybe is using Vim and wants to try NeoVim and wants to get into some of the Lua stuff that NeoVim makes very readily available for users of the text editor. So first things first, let's check what version of Vim we have. I'm gonna use the version flag. This is a pretty new version of NeoVim. It's not a nightly build, but some of the things I wanna be talking about in here are really only applying to newest versions of NeoVim. There's really no reason you shouldn't be on the latest version of NeoVim, upgrade if possible. So what we wanna do in here is we want to create a new directory. This is gonna be our nvim directory inside of .config. This is the default location that nvim will look for your Lua configurations. Let's head inside of there. And what we wanna do is we're just gonna to touch a init.lua. This is similar to how core Vim does it with a init.vim script. And this is really the entry point, the Lua entry point for our whole configuration for the whole editor. So we touch that file, we look here and we just have an init.lua. If we vim into init.lua, this is the basic, most unconfigured NeoVim experience right here. I don't have anything as far as configurations, remappings, plugins, anything. At this point, we could start writing some Lua to actually configure our editor, but I wanna to touch on a few very key resources that you are going to need as you go through this journey. First is the actual Lua documentation itself. The whole documentation sits in this reference manual, which is actually very small. Again, Lua is extremely lightweight. It's a very, very small programming language. So the entire reference manual is pretty small actually and fairly well Googleable. So I definitely recommend that you bookmark this reference manual. It's a very good resource. Next, another very key resource is the Lua NVIM reference manual here. This is basically all of the API endpoints that you can access when you're configuring NeoVim with Lua. And I really mean everything. This thing is huge. I'm not gonna be able to touch on all of the different endpoints and things that you could possibly configure within NeoVim, but if you wanna find it, it's in here. Command F to search is really, really useful and you can quickly find things like color, and boom, it takes me right to something about color within this whole giant page. And finally, another documentation resource that I find extremely useful is the options reference manual. This is all of the options that exist within Vim, things that you would typically set, quote unquote, within a Vim script. They can all be found within here and can be easily accessed and found with command F, search this whole page, it's one giant document again. So we're back here in our init.lua file and in this file, we can start just writing some configurations and it really will be executed top to bottom. The way I kind of like to think about Lua is it's almost like JavaScript meets C, but much simpler, maybe like a Python C or something. It's really nice. And you can think of it as just like a scripting language executing each step you give it down as it goes. 
So maybe the first thing we want to do, this is something I do in a lot of my environments, is I set a different map leader. This is maybe the key that you would set to initiate some sort of shortcut you have or something. And usually I set that to space. So what we can do is we can access vim.g and that's the global variables, much like you would set it in a vim script.g and we can go map leader and I'm gonna make it space. So that now will set my map leader to be space. Uh, next, what I wanna do is maybe set a key mapping. This is another thing I do in a ton of my different configurations. Uh, so what I wanna do is vim.api, and I'm gonna do nvim set key map. And again, this is an API endpoint that you can find within the Lua reference manual in NeoVim. This is just kind of an example of setting you up for getting some Lua going. So what I wanna do here is I want in insert mode, I'm gonna roll JK, that's how I do my exit instead of actually hitting the escape key. We're gonna say escape. And then we also need to give it the no remap options, which we can just throw in here. This is a table in Lua. There's actually only one data structure in Lua and it maps keys to values. It's the table, it's the one data structure you get. So I'm gonna say no remap, uh, remap, and this is gonna be true and that looks fine. Uh, why don't we, whoopsie, I'm just trying to do it there. Let's save and quit. Let's vim init.lua and see it working. So I can go to insert mode, hit JK, and I get the escape. Again, insert JK, and it escapes. Perfect, so this is working. Okay, one more thing I wanna do quick. Let's vim.o, which is for options. Again, that options documentation is super useful. I'm gonna set relative number equal to true let's save and quit that again vim init.lua and there we are we see our relative numbers right there so this is very similar to how you would configure many of the options within a vim script in your init.vim but we're doing it in lua and accessing these apis that we get automatically in this environment from nvim so that's all good and well and nice. You can set some options, you can set some different things. It's a full programming language, so you could even do conditional option setting for different things. It's all there, it's great. But what about some plugins? Plugins is a huge part of actually configuring your environment. I personally like to use Packer. And here we can see it's GitHub page, packer.nvim. This is my personal preference for a packaging solution, but in general, a lot of the nvim specific ones work with Lua. This one is a pure Lua solution with no vim script or anything, so it's super fast, it's super nice. Now, one thing I want to mention when working with Lua is you can actually define some different Lua scripts that it will load in succession as you define in your init.lua. So what you would wanna do is make a new directory, call this Lua. So if we look here now, I have my init.lua and a Lua folder. And that Lua folder is automatically loaded and sort of known, quote unquote, to the environment when you run this and when it gets loaded into NVim. So let's head into Lua. I'm going to touch, uh, let's just call this Packer, Packer.lua. And we're gonna Vim, Packer, Dot Lua. So now what we could do in here is actually define declaratively really is how Packer likes to do this, our different plugins that we're gonna use. I'm just gonna use two as a quick example. Uh, so what we wanna do, so we're actually gonna return something outside of this. We're gonna return, uh, we're going to, we're going to require, uh, we're gonna require Packer, and then we are going to call startup uh, with a callback function. We're just gonna say Packer can manage itself. This is a very Packer Vim specific thing, but, but what we're gonna call within this callback function is this very special use function that Packer knows about. And we're gonna use packer.nvim. And that really is the shorthand for the GitHub URL. Packer can know about a bunch of different things. It can know about the shorthand GitHub URLs or full on URLs that it'll pull down all the necessary files to actually load in that plugin. So we're gonna use packer.nvim. It can actually just manage itself, which is super, super nice. And then uh, we want to set up for an example here, just a color scheme. Uh, I really like Groovebox. So we're gonna use Groovebox community Groovebox. All right, cool. And then to finish this out, we're just gonna call end, which finishes out that callback function inside of that chunk. 
and then we are good inside of there. But this just kind of exists in a separate file inside of our Lua directory. We actually have to get this into our init.vim. Remember, our init.vim file is really the top level loader of all these different things. So let's get out of here. Let's head back up to our top level directory. We're gonna vim init.lua. So what we need to come in here and do is actually do another require to bring in and load up that file we just wrote with all the Packer commands. So then it knows about and can use all that stuff. Really, you were kind of entering that script file via a require so that we can get all the stuff loaded into this runtime. So we're gonna require Packer, 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 there we go. And if we do a quick tree here, Notice that I didn't put Lua in front of Packer or add the dot Packer. Really all we care about is this Packer name here, which it knows about and can actually grab. If we had nested directories in here, say we had Lua slash plugin slash Packer, we would call plugin slash Packer, which would then load it into our runtime. So if we go back in there, vim init.lua, this is mad because it's calling a couple of requires. Okay, those errors were actually a little funky. I made a mistake. I had called that file, I'd called that file just Packer, which actually clashed with the name Packer from Packer itself in the upstream. So I just renamed it Packer Plugins. If we look uh, there, we can see, I renamed it Packer Plugins. If we look at the init.lua, we can see require Packer Plugins, the name of that file, the path to that file, minus Lua, minus the file extension. So now we are in here, we don't have any errors. And what we can do is we can call Packer Sync, and this is gonna load up a bunch of stuff. And boom, there it goes. It loaded those two packages, Groovebox and Packer itself, because it can manage itself, which is very nice. And we can start actually doing some configurations with those things. So we can quit out of here. And what I want to do now is configure Groovebox and use it and actually use a specific file that corresponds to that specific plugin within our plugin directories. Now something interesting happened with Packer. If we look at our tree, there's this plugin directory right there with Packer compile.lua. That's a bunch of the compiled stuff that it grabbed from our upstream plugins. Now Vim and NVim are very interesting in that it will look in a few locations to actually load up some files. So if we look here, we can see that Vim will load all plugins in these directories and below at .config and Vim plugin. And I personally take advantage of this. Again, there's probably a million different ways to do this, but what I like to do is actually place specific files that correspond to specific plugins inside of that NVim plugin directory. That way it's all just there, nice and bundled up, right next to our compiled Packer Lua file. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna touch plugin, and we're just gonna call this groovebox.lua. Let's go in there, plug in groovebox.lua. And what I wanna do here is just set the color scheme. Uh, basically a one line configuration. So maybe overkill for its own file. But I think this demonstrates very well how we can actually auto load a bunch of stuff inside of that plugins directory. So what we're gonna do is vim.command and we can give it color uh, scheme groovebox. There we go. This is the same as if I was doing color scheme right here like this. I'm basically calling a command into the editor, setting our color scheme as group box. So let's exit out of here. Let's reload init.lua and boom, there we go. It automatically loaded up Groovebox for us via that configuration file. Again, note that I did not call a require within our init.lua here. It's actually just in this plugins directory right there that it loaded automatically because NVim knew to look in there and load up a bunch of stuff that it found in there automatically. It's very nice. And I think this is generally the shape of how I've seen a lot of people do this, where the plugin directory has very plugin specific configurations and maybe you have a Lua directory with some Lua specific things that you then require via your top level or some top level files that inevitably will be called somehow from your init.lua. But this plugin directory gets a little confusing for people because it's not actually being called from your init.lua. Vim just knows how to grab it. Vim just knows how to find it and get it. 
And using those basic principles, that is exactly how I build my NVIM environment. I have a Lua folder here with some nested folders for some global configurations and global remaps, basically what we looked at in this video, as well as some configuration specific for the LSP client. That is the language server protocol and some basic remappings to go to definition, to go to declaration, like you would in something like VS Code or IntelliJ. I also have this plugins directory, like basically rebuilt it like we did here using Packer to get all the packages, all those plugins. And then I have my plugin directory there with all of these specific plugin configurations. There's our Groovebox configuration. It's not very interesting one liner, but I can do plugin specific things and call plugin specific APIs that are very nicely organized into each of these. And that's really it. It ends up just being a lot of configurations that you find from these specific plugins that have sort of bought into the Lua ecosystem. However, I will say that some of these are a little different than their Vim script counterparts. So if you're buying into the whole Lua way of doing NeoVim, then there might be a little bit of work you need to do if you're transitioning over from Vim specific plugins. The last thing I'll say that I really like about this environment and using Lua is that it's actually really, really easy to write plugins yourself. It was a bit daunting at first, but this is a plugin that I wrote that basically does uh, language server protocol stuff and Go client things uh, that would be maybe a competitor to Vim Go. And if we just look at some of the Lua stuff, it's actually not too bad. And I think it's pretty parsable, especially if you know a bit of JavaScript or have touched Lua in any way in the past. In my opinion, it's much more readable than something like VimScript and easier to parse through, which I think is a definite plus for going full on in Lua. I hope this video was useful and I hope that it enables you to use those basic principles to start building out your own Lua-based NeoVim configuration. It's super powerful, it's super fast, and I like it a lot. I really do think that this is the direction that the Vim community is going to be headed in the future. It's all Lua all the time, especially with Vim 9 coming out with their own scripting language that I'm sure is just gonna be hard to adopt, riddled with bugs, but you know what, we'll see. Never say never in software, anything is possible. So thank you everybody for watching this video. I really appreciate it. I will catch you next time, peace.